acceptance movement. I did a search of my book and found out that I mentioned them more than 80 some times. Um, so this will be not a long evening. I've tried, tried to uh, cut down uh, some versions of, of my speech, but, and as she said, we will pause. I have reminders to myself to stop at certain places to see if there are questions. Um, so please keep your questions in mind as, as they come up. And I'm going to be uh, running a slideshow as I talk. No, that's not it. All right. In the second chapter of my book, Remember the Ladies, I give an introduction to the 70 plus years of struggle for women to gain the right to vote. And I ask, what kind of women would take up the banner at a time when women virtually were forbidden to speak in public? Early on, they were mostly white, middle-class, and most often members of the Society of Friends, known as Quakers. Their religion allowed women more agency, accepted them as equals to men, imparted a duty to see others as equal to themselves, and compelled them to seek justice for all. The early reformers tended to be more educated than women of similar social standing at a time when few girls had any schooling beyond scant basics no matter how well off their parents were, because few schools were open to them. Quaker girls were generally receiving educations equal to the boys. Quakers have figured in the long campaign for women's rights since the very formation of the nation. They would become the backbone of the women's movement, nurturing it and propelling it forward for the remainder of the century, as I say in my book. In 1776, after it adopted the Declaration of Independence, the Second Continental Congress focused on running the Revolutionary War and asked the new states to begin drafting constitutions. New Jersey became the only colony to grant women the right to vote. All adult residents who owned a specified amount of property could vote. New Jersey made history by recognizing the right of women to vote. The enormity of this event cannot be overstated. Never before in all of recorded history had women been given voting rights, a Heritage Foundation article said. Because of laws restricting women's property rights, in actuality, the New Jersey law meant only widowed and single women owning property could vote. Those women who could readily took advantage of the law voting until 1807 when the legislature suddenly discovered a political need to reinterpret the constitution and stripped women and free black men of the vote, limiting it to white male tax paying adult citizens. Historians had long considered New Jersey's enfranchisement of women somewhat of a fluke because the constitution was written in haste as British troops headed for New Jersey after George Washington's forces suffered several defeats in New York. Perhaps the drafters merely forgot to exclude women by choosing the word inhabitants. Other historians credit John Cooper, a Quaker from Gloucester County, with getting the provision for women into the Constitution. One article speculated that certainly the Quaker belief in the equality of women was a major influence on members from the southern part of the state, where they were a large percentage of the population. Next, Quakers play major roles in opening other avenues that set the stage for, women's, for the women's movement, including education and public speaking. Quakers had no prohibition against women speaking and they recognized women as preachers. The Society of Friends was on the forefront when it came to educating girls. When few academies were open to other girls, Quaker girls were often attending local or boarding schools. Quaker women were among the first to speak to mixed audiences of men and women, usually on abolition issues. The Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina, I went too fast. Sarah and Angelina became the most well-known American women on the anti-slavery lecture circuit.
Many people roundly criticized them for having the audacity to speak to mixed audiences and they defended their right to do so. Born into a Charleston, South Carolina slaveholding family, they went north and lectured widely on the horrors of slavery. Sarah had been to Philadelphia to seek treatment for and tend to her dying father. There she met members of the Society of Friends. After returning home, she was determined to flee the evils of slavery. In 1821, she converted to Quakerism and moved to Philadelphia. Angelina joined her in 1829. In 1836, Angelina wrote an appeal to the Christian women of the South, urging them to rise up against slavery. The American Anti-Slavery Society asked Angelina and Sarah to speak to small groups of women in homes. When 300 women came for the first one, they moved the meeting to a church. When men started coming to hear them, some people were particularly horrified that the Grimke spoke before mixed audiences of women and men, referred to then as promiscuous audiences. Angelina and Sarah became more outspoken and became active in the women's rights movement. As late as 1870, the aging sisters led a contingent of 40 women through a snowstorm to cast ballots in Massachusetts. The Grimp case paved the way for other women to come forward and speak, including Lucretia Mott of Philadelphia, and uh, a Quaker teacher and later preacher, and Abby Kelly Foster, a teacher and former Quaker, and Susan B. Anthony, who became an agent for the Anti-Slavery Society. Lucretia Coffin was born in January, on January 3rd, 1793, in the whaling town of Nantucket, Massachusetts. Hold on, we're going in the wrong direction. Lucretia Mott was born on January 3rd, 1793 in the Wheeling town of Nantucket, Massachusetts. Her forebears had been its first non-native settlers and had carried on a long tradition of Quakerism. Her ancestor, Mary Coffin Starbuck, had converted virtually the entire island to it. Mott attended school with boys. The women of Nantucket also took care of their husband's business affairs for weeks and sometimes years as they were away at sea as whalers. A Quaker minister, Elizabeth Cogshaw, who visited the island in 1801, impressed upon Lucretia the need to focus on her inner light and to improve her conscience, and to follow her conscience, rather. At 13, she went to, with her sister Eliza to the Nine Partner School, a Quaker school in Dutchess County, New York. There, she met her husband, James Mott, grandson of the headmaster, and became a teacher at the school at a young age. They moved to Philadelphia and were married at the Pine Street Meeting House. Lucretia Mott became a preacher in 1821 and traveled widely. James joined the Pennsylvania Abolition Society and served as secretary from 1822 to 1823. Philadelphia was not only a hub for Quakers, it was also home to the largest community of free blacks in the North. And the city was a hotbed of abolitionist ideas and underground railroad activity. In 1827, Lucretia began reading more radical literature like Mary Wollstonecroft's highly influential Vindication of the Rights of Women, asserting we women's rights to an education and other fundamentals, and she circulated it to everyone who would read it. Her hospitality was legendary. 20 to 50 guests, whites and blacks, would mingle at the Mott home often, which was not common. A fellow abolitionist even brought Henry Box Brown, the man who escaped slavery by having himself shipped in a box, to meet Lucretia Mott at her home after uncrating him. William Lloyd Garrison formed the American Anti-Slavery Society to advocate for immediate emancipation. At its founding meeting in 1833 in Philadelphia, 70 delegates, all male, attended, including James Mott and black abolitionists Robert Purvis and James McCrummel, a barber dentist from Philadelphia. Lucretia Mott attended with her mother, a sister, an older daughter, as well as several other Quaker women, Lydia White, Esther Moore, and Sidney Ann Lewis among them. The women were supposed to be observers, but Mott spoke up several times offering suggestions. 
Women were not invited to join the anti-slavery society, but were encouraged to form their own. Four days later, Mott and a group of black and white women formed the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society in a breakthrough for female activism that challenged notions about race and gender. Gender. The women asked Dr. McCrummel to preside because they had little experience with running meetings involving parliamentary procedure and voting. Mott was on the committee to write the constitution along with Margareta Fortin, a daughter of James Fortin, a free black abolitionist and wealthy businessman and with Sarah McCrummel, the wife of James. The women participated in the Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women in 1837 in New York City with 175 women from 10 states and 20 women's abolitionist societies. With that convention, abolitionist women sparked a women's movement, nurturing it and propelling it forward for the remainder of the century. I'm gonna break here for questions. Is there anybody have any so far? I can't see the chat room with the slide up. Let me see. So Rachel, far, so far there's no questions. Okay, then I'm gonna gonna proceed. If you see any, uh, perhaps we can pause then when one appears. Um, when they held their second convention in May 1838 in Pennsylvania Hall a new building paid for by abolitionists. Mobs opposed to abolition and race mixing surrounded and broke up a session. As attendees left, white women took black women by the arm to make sure they passed through the jeering mob safely. Later that night, the mob burned the building to the ground four days after it opened. An historical marker for the female society stands at Fifth and Arch Streets in Philadelphia and a marker for Pennsylvania Hall is near its former location at 109 Sixth Street. Most of the women in the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society knew each other from the free produce movement, which advocated the boycotting of goods produced by slave labor, including sugar, molasses, cotton, and rice. Abolitionists reasoned that if the market for such goods dried up, so would slavery. The Fortin's other daughter, Harriet, was married to Robert Purvis, founder of the Colored Free Produce Society, and James Mott had started the Free Produce Society of Philadelphia. Both societies disseminated information on where to get goods that slave labor had not produced. Lucretia Mott even persuaded her husband to give up the cotton trade for wool. She favored immediate absolute emancipation in contrast to other abolitionists who would accept schemes for gradual progress and for colonization, the deportation of freed blacks to new territories. Lucretia Mott also opposed payments to slaveholders to purchase the freedom of individuals, arguing that such purchases acknowledged the right of one person to own another. In 1838, after Britain ended slavery, American abolitionists received invitations to a world anti-slavery convention in London. Lucretia Mott was a delegate for four anti-slavery free produce and Quaker organizations. Seven other American women were among the delegates. When British organizers heard the Americans intent to send women, they sent out another call specifying a preference for gentlemen as representatives. The Americans ignored it. At the start of the convention in May 1840, the majority voted to bar women from participating, but let them sit in a segregated section. Some male delegates sat with them, including Charles Lennox Remond, an African-American lecturer from Massachusetts. While in London, the Mott stayed at a rooming house where Henry Stanton, a delegate for the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, and his bride, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, were staying. The trip was part of their honeymoon. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton became friends. Although she wasn't a delegate, Stanton was angry at the way the women were treated. She, had widely, she has widely been quoted as saying the two women discussed calling a women's convention on their return. However, Mott disputed that, but later acknowledged to Stanton that they might have talked about it on a later occasion in Boston. 
Elizabeth Stanton considered the London dispute over seating women as the start of the movement for women's rights. Mott dated the women's movement from the first National Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women. In any case, neither Mott nor Stanton did anything to organize the convention until eight years later. In July, 1848, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martha Wright, and nearly 300 other women and men, included, including the abolitionist editor, Frederick Douglass, gathered for a convention at Seneca Falls, New York. A group primarily made up of Quaker women organized that conference. The meeting took place when and where it did because Lucretia Mott happened to be visiting in the area in the Finger Lakes region that was a breeding ground of religious reform and social experimentation. The Motts had become supporters of Elias Hicks, a preacher who criticized the Quaker hierarchy for, among other things, equivocation on slavery. Some were slaveholders or profited from slavery. Hicksite friends had congregated in the area, relocating from Philadelphia, New Jersey, and elsewhere. At the yearly meeting many belonged to, one faction had split off from the Hicksites to form the Progressive Friends, emphasizing more equal standing for women and promoting greater anti-slavery activism. The Mots visited Lucretia's sister, Martha Wright, six months pregnant, a writer and abolitionist in Auburn, New York. The Society of Friends had disowned her for marrying an outsider in 1824. Her husband died two years later and she remarried. The Wrights and their neighbors were also active participants in the Underground Railroad and the heroic conductor, Harriet Tubman, lived nearby and continued to help escapees make the last leg to Canada. When the Mots came to the area, Elizabeth Stanton had moved from Boston to nearby Seneca Falls in 1847 with her husband, Henry. In early July, 1848, Elizabeth was invited to a tea party at the home of Jane Hunt, wife of Richard Hunt, a merchant and mill owner in Waterloo, only a mile or two from Seneca Falls. Lucretia Mott was the guest of honor, accompanied by her sister, Martha, Others invited included Marianne McClintock, wife of Thomas McClintock, a pharmacist and officer in the Anti-Slavery Society, and her two grown daughters, Elizabeth and Marianne. All the women present were Quakered or disowned Quakers, except Stanton, who was nominally Presbyterian. The Hunts and McClintocks were among the most radical abolitionists and their homes were stations on the Underground Railroad. The homes are today part of the National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. The McClintocks also boycotted slave-made goods at home and in their store. Marianne had been one of the founding members of the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society before moving to Waterloo. The women who gathered that day discussed the Boston Anti-Slavery, Anti-Sabbath Convention, I'm sorry, and the Hicksite Quaker yearly meeting that the Mots had attended and in which all of them sided with the progressives. They talked about the passage that April of the New York Married Women's Property Act, which let wives retain property they brought into the marriage and other issues. At some point, Stanton said she poured out her frustrations regarding the plight of women and planted the seed for calling a meeting to discuss the laws and customs that deprived them of freedoms. Hunt family lore suggests that Richard Hunt, hearing the discussion, urged them to act on their convictions, citing scripture, faith without works is dead. James 2, 17, King James Virgin, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. By the end of the day, the women decided to hold a convention, while Lucretia Mott, by then the most famous woman in America, was still in the vicinity, because she would draw a crowd. They placed a notice in the local paper, the Seneca County Courier, that appeared July 11th. Lucretia Mott also sent the notice to Frederick Douglass, who published it in the North Star a few days later, and other regional papers published it as well. A few days later, Stanton, Marianne McClintock, and her daughters gathered at her home to write a declaration 
of sentiments and resolutions for the convention, similar to those that they were familiar with from anti-slavery conventions. Stanton drafted something, but they decided to model it on the Declaration of Independence, substituting that all men, that all men and women are created equal. Stanton was to complete the sen sentiments and the resolution. She inserted wording demanding enfranchisement of women. The organizers feared that few, if any, would show up for the meeting but were pleasantly surprised to find nearly 300 had arrived, coming from a 50 mile radius. At the convention, when Stanton read the resolution on enfranchisement, Mott exclaimed, Lizzie, they will make us ridiculous or subject to ridicule because the very idea of women obtaining the vote was so far-fetched. The Mott biographer, Carol Faulkner, speculated that the document might have been far different if Mott had participated in the drafting. She, as a Quaker, rejected any political participation and did not see the vote as a goal or remedy for women's oppression. Only Frederick Douglass spoke for the resolution and it carried. 68 women and 32 men signed the Declaration of Sentiments. After the sessions at Seneca Falls, Douglass wrote about it in the North Star on July 28, 1848. Christopher Densmore, in an article on Quaker women in, in the women's rights movement, noted the first women's rights convention was conceived, organized, and carried to a successful conclusion within 11 days. The rapid and successful organization of the convention was possible because of the availability of, pre, of a pre-existing network of radical reformers. Some participants, mostly Quaker again, called a follow-up meeting for August 2nd in Rochester to discuss the implications of the first meeting before the Mots left the area. Amy Kirby Post, another Hicksite Quaker abolitionist who had been in Seneca Falls, invited Lucretia Mott to be the keynote speaker. They would meet at the Unitarian Church. The meetings bolstered Lucretia Mott's commitment to advocating for women's rights and established her as the primary leader of the movement. In 1849, Mott published a discourse on women in answer to a speech by Richard Dana, a poet and critic who had ridiculed the idea of political equality for women. Mott wrote in defense of women's right to participate in the public sphere and even the right to vote. Far be it from me to encourage women to vote and take part in politics in the present state of our government, she said but women's right to the elective franchise is the same and should be yielded to her whether she exercised that right or not. Mott remained active in the women's movement for life, often sharing conventions before the Civil War and briefly afterward. Even when the movement later split over the issue of enfranchising black men and not women, she kept peace on both sides. She died November 11th, 18, 1880 in Sheltonham, PA, and is buried at Fair Hill Burial Ground. In her eulogy to Lucretia Mott in 1881, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, Lucretia Mott was a philanthropist. Her life was dedicated to the rights of humanity. When the poet, the novelist, the philosopher, and the metaphysician had been forgotten, the memory of the true reformer will remain engraven on the hearts of the multitude. Do I have any questions so far? You do have a comment. Mm -hmm. Lorraine has posted in the question box, proud to say my third great grandfather, Eusebius Bernard, was one of the 58 who founded Longwood Progressive Friends and his brother-in-law, Jacob Painter, was the one who urged the 1852 PA Women's Convention the first in PA to be held. That's great. Good to hear yeah, that. Thank you. Thank you wonderful. for offering that. Great. All right, then we're gonna, gonna move on. Oh, wait, I got one more question. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, someone asked, where is the marker for the hall located? I think I gave the address, but I, don't, I have to flip back to it. Um, let me see. 
It's at 109 North 6th Street. It's near the uh, television studio, I noticed one day. For I, I think that's WHYY. It's in, it's in that block. Um, but I was going there to interview and saw it before, before I got there. So it's a look around there. Okay. All right. Another woman who figures in the movement, of course, was Susan B. Anthony, um, who emerged as the dominant leader in the struggle for the vote. She was raised a Quaker and later became a Unitarian. As I say in my book, Anthony came to the women's rights movement a bit later than some of the other prominent figures, but with perhaps more zeal than anyone. And she stayed on the battlefield the longest. For more than a half century, she was the movement. She drew on her values from her upbringing in a home where she was encouraged to learn and where being a reformer was an expectation. Her parents' home had been a gathering place for like-minded abolitionists and other reformers, including Frederick Douglass on Sunday afternoons. One historian described the home as a mecca for fugitive slaves and abolitionists. Anthony was born in Adams, Massachusetts on February 15, 1820, but her father Daniel later moved the family to Rochester, New York, where he owned a cotton mill and a farm in addition to working as an insurance agent. Daniel's mother, Hannah Latham Anthony, was an elder in their meeting house in Adams, and his sister, Hannah F. Anthony Hoxie, was a well-known preacher. His friend's meeting rebuked him for marrying an outsider, Lucy Reed Anthony, a Baptist who never converted. Daniel Anthony sent his three older daughters, Gelma, Susan, and Hannah, to Quaker boarding schools. Susan attended Deborah Molson's Friends Female Academy near Philadelphia, but returned home when her family fell on hard times in 1837. She started teaching to contribute her earnings to help her family, eventually becoming headmistress of the female department of the Kanahojari Academy. After her school closed in 1849, Susan went back home. Susan's father introduced her to Douglas and they became lifelong friends despite differences later. A sculpture in a small park near Anthony's home in Rochester memorializes their friendship, depicting them sitting and having tea. When she returned home, she also found her family had begun attending the first Unitarian Church of Rochester as they felt their Quaker church was not friendly to the anti-slavery cause. Her parents and sister Mary had attended the second women's rights convention there in 1848 and signed the same de declaration of sentiments that had been adopted at Seneca Falls. In September, 1852, Susan Anthony attended her first women's rights convention, the National Women's Rights Convention in Syracuse, New York, where she could meet the Mott's and other leaders of this new movement. Thereafter, Anthony became a regular at the women's national and state meetings, rising through the leadership and often serving as an officer of the convention. Susan also began attending anti-slavery meetings and she traveled for a week with the famed abolitionist and former Quaker, Abby Kelly Foster and her husband, Stephen. I showed her picture earlier. On November 5th, 1872, Anthony led more than a dozen women, mostly Quakers, including her three sisters and friend Rhoda DeGarmo, to the polls in Rochester to vote. A poll watcher challenged Anthony on her qualifications to vote, but she was allowed to cast a ballot. Federal warrants for the arrest of Anthony and 14 other women were issued nine days after the election, charging them with voting without having a lawful right to do so. On Thanksgiving day, a US Marshal showed up at Anthony's home to arrest her. She was later tried, convicted and fined $100, but refused to pay the fine. Susan B. Anthony died March 13, 1906, at the age of 86 and is buried at Mount Hope Cemetery, Rochester, where voters gather every election day to put stickers on her grave. I want to show one more picture of her. Finally, let's consider Alice Paul, who was a Quaker, born January 11, 1885, in Mount Laurel Township, New Jersey. Her parents were William Nickel Paul and Tacey Perry Paul, but she was a and she was a descendant of William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. 
Paul went to Morristown Friends School and studied at Swarthmore College where, she, where her mother's relatives had been among the founders. She earned a master's and doctoral degree in sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. She became a social worker in New York City and then moved to England to study at the Woodbroke Quaker Study Center, the University of Birmingham and the London School of Economics. In Britain, she joined the women's movement and became one of its most militant activists. Paul was arrested several times during suffrage demonstration, served three jail terms, went on hunger strikes and endured forced feedings. After returning from England in 1910, she attended the convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. In 1913, she organized a grand procession for the NAWSA in Washington, DC, the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration as president, with an estimated 5,000 to 8,000 participants. She later left the NAWSA over financial and strategic differences to form the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage and later the National Women's Party. In early January 1917, representatives of the Women's Party, the Silent Sentinels, began picketing the White House daily, rain, snow, sleet, hail, holding suffrage signs. Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? And how long must women wait for liberty? No one had ever picketed the White House, but at first they were largely ignored. President Wilson would even tip his hat as he came and went through the gates or urge that they be invited in for tea if the weather was particularly brutal. They refused. After the United States entered World War I in April 1917, many people viewed the picketers as disloyal and mobs would attack them. In June 1917, picketers were arrested on charges of obstructing traffic. Over the next six months, many, including Paul, were convicted and incarcerated at the Occoquan Workhouse in Virginia and the District of Columbia Jail. In jail, they were subjected to harsh conditions, infested food, beatings, and force feedings after they went on hunger strike. Paul was even held in a psychiatric unit for some time. The women were all released in November 1917. The NAWSA never condoned their practices or offered support. Within two months of their release, Wilson announced support for the Women's Suffrage Amendment. The 19th Amendment passed the House of Representatives May 21, 1919, and the Senate on June 4, 1919. It went to the states for ratification. When ratification came down to the wire with Tennessee poised to become the 36th and final state needed to ratify, Alice Paul went there to lobby for it. On August 18, 1920, Tennessee ratified and the U.S. Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby certified the amendment's adoption on August 26, 1920. Alice Paul helped draft the Equal Rights Amendment and got it introduced in Congress in 1923 and was still active in efforts to get it ratified when it passed Congress in 1972. Paul died at the age of 92 on July 9, 1977 at the Greenleaf Extension Home, a Quaker facility in Moorestown, New Jersey. She is buried at Westfield Friends Burial Ground, Cinnamonson, New Jersey, where people frequently leave notes at her tombstone to thank her for her activism for women's rights. Without her, who helped bring home the final victory for women's suffrage and the brave Quaker women who started the women's movement. It is difficult to say who would have taken up the fight. We all owe a debt of gratitude to the friends. Thank you. Okay, so I do have a question. Okay. Evelyn asked, is Iron Jawed Angels an accurate movie about the suffrage movement? It, I have seen it, it is re, uh, relatively accurate. Yes, I, I can't remember any glaring inaccuracies. Um, and the, I just showed the cover for Jail for Freedom. Uh, Doris Stevens, the author of that is depicted in that movie. As one of her, her as one of her friends and associates. So. Okay. 
And then um, Sean in the chat box said that he is looking forward, forward to hearing more about your research that helped form the background for your book. Um, I did a lot of re research, at, um, and if, if you if I showed you a real scene of my office, you you would uh, notice it. <laughs> there's there's still books thrown all over my my room here. Um, I found early on that just going to the library and taking a few notes was not sufficient for most of what I needed, um, and I bought a lot of the books that I I needed so that I could go back and forth to them, and you know I, I would get to a place in my writing where something wasn't clear or something was disputed or I wish I just uh, probed a little bit harder on a particular subject. Um, as I say, the, one of the difficulties of writing about women is nobody wrote about women. Um, so a lot of what is out there is sketchy and or it's conflicting from book to book and I would have to keep going back and forth and, to see what I thought was the most accurate version of something might have been or could have been. Um, like, you know, one version would say a certain woman was at, at an event and she wasn't, um, that kind of thing. Um, who was leading what, who, you know, who lobbied where, uh, all of those things were, were often in dispute. I also spent, I spent a lot of time with the history of women's suffrage written by, uh, or edited by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony with, with, with others. Um, and it is extremely difficult to manipulate because it's pages, of, you know, it's six mm -hmm. volumes and it's hundreds of pages and you kind of have to know where you are and go back and forth and try to figure out where did I see that before. Um, and I just had to do a lot of it all over again. One for, for the introduction to Jailed for Freedom, I had to go back to books that I'd been in before and sometimes I couldn't find the same quote I had used the last time. Um, and Jailed for Freedom was more closely footnoted than, remember the ladies that um, my publisher requires that you use endnotes. And sometimes when you look at the endnote, you're not sure which quote goes to that endnote, um, even having written it yourself. So they, there was that. Um, and I also just recently finished a long article for the National Women's History Museum, which is, exists only virtually at the moment. Um, but they, they were putting together a publication and um, I had to write tens of thousands of words, again, footnoted um, <laughs> <laughs> about, about the suffrage move, movement um, and about the anti-suffrage movement, which I hadn't written as much about in my book. So that was a lot of tedious going back and forth. But in general, I read two or three biographies of just about it. Everybody mentioned certainly the, the, the three women I just focused on the most. Um, and one who's not Quaker, who, who totally fascinates me is a woman named Lucy Stone, um, who was one of the early leaders in the movement, even before Anthony was. Um, and she, you know, she led a faction of, of the women's suffrage movement for many, many years and, and ran one of the, the uh, publications. But I believe she was maybe Methodist comes to mind, but I'm not, I'm not positive of it. So I know she's a Protestant of some sort. So That's interesting, of, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of reading involved. Let me just put it that way. So. <laughs> I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any other questions that they would like to place in the Q&A box? Um, I know I have one about okay. Alice Paul while she was in the British women suffrage movement. Um, can you like talk about like the techniques that she brought from the British British suffrage movement into the American? Well, sure. The, well, the, the main idea that she brought um, was that they should target the national government first of all. The the um, National American Women's Suffrage Association was still largely go trying to get state by state referenda passed, which is a grueling, tedious process at best. And they weren't having that much success in it. They did have a federal amendment, but they hadn't put a lot of effort into it in years. So the first thing Alice Paul asked to do was to run the federal campaign. Um, the second idea she brought to it was that they should target specifically the leader of the ruling party, which in this case was Woodrow Wilson. 
Carrie Chapman Catt, who ran the National American uh, Association, did not think these tactics would work. Um, but the other person, she had been to, to Britain to um, look over some of the, their, their methodology and, and talk to people too. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet, had also been in Britain for a number of years, married to a Brit. And she brought home some ideas about the movement. The tactics, uh, they never became, the Americans never became as militant as the British, um, you know, who actually threw bricks and broke up meetings and you know, <laughs> things like, like that. Um, but they took to the streets with the, with the grand parades and the and the, the picketing and whatever were ideas she brought home and even the hunger strike she she had been jailed and been on hunger strike in britain with, with the british women so um all of those pretty much were tactics she brought home and put to use so does that answer your question it does it does thank you i do have some more questions by Audrey. It's kind of like two questions. Mm -hmm. Your book is in an all almanac form. Had you expected that when you first conceptualized the book? Yes. Um, one of the things about my book is it was done basically on request from the publisher. Um, I had uh, worked closely with uh, my my husband was uh, until last Friday or so vice president at, at uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer. A couple of years ago, he did a book on Obama's legacy, um, and I helped with that. And his editor was somebody that I, I already knew. One when we finished, she asked if there was anything I wanted to write, and I uh, proposed a couple of book ideas that she rejected. But <laughs> she said we have this suffrage anniversaries coming up. And we need somebody to start thinking about writing this. But, and it was in time for the, the New York State was going to have its centennial of the passage of, of its state re referendum on women's vote in uh, 17. And they wanted out in time for that. And I think the, the format originally was their suggestion on how to approach it. And it became really, really a good approach a good tool because I was able to break up the subjects um, into you know a sidebar about a particular woman or a particular side issue um, or a particular event and uh, for those who haven't read it it reads kind of like a magazine I tell tell people they, <laughs> they can pick it up anywhere really and read it read for you know an hour or so and then there's you know there's no continuity issues you can come back tomorrow and read about a different woman or you don't have to read certain parts of it all it's certainly not a straight narrative um at all and I liked it that way. The publisher began to, to describe it as an as an almanac, and, and I feel that way. And some part of it is also my training as a, a, I'm a former newspaper editor and a former magazine editor, um, so I know how to do that. And it, you know, it's a comfortable way to approach <laughs> topics for me, um, and I think it's friendly for the reader. So, and even you know, even for young people, um, I know of children who have read it, so or are reading it. Oh. So, you know, it, it, it has a lot of application because it's, it, you know, it's short chapters, it's short um, it's sentences and paragraphs, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but certainly the ability to, to pick and choose your subjects and you know, what you, you don't want to know more about that, you don't have to read that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's easily marked for you to be able to do that. So. I found it very easy to digest everything because it just, it's such a long period. Right. That they were fighting for. And when the two groups split apart, it can get confusing. And mm -hmm. um, I just found it very, it's a very easy read, I found, yeah. to follow the movement through right. time. And, it, you know, it could be a very, very difficult narrative to get through if you were try, trying to write, write it in, in the street, because it, it is. There's so many players, and then, you know, this branch branches off to here, and then they split <laughs> again, and then, oh, all right. You know who, who's running the show now you know it's it, it's it's a lot of names it's a lot of states it's a lot a lot of votes um many many issues involved so 
Audrey did have another question. Mm -hmm. And in the course of your research, what did you learn that surprised you the most? Um, I think the radicalism of the women, particularly not, not just radicalism for women's suffrage, but I didn't really know, know or understand how radical they were about abolition. Um, the extent to which it's, um, many of them were involved in the Underground Railroad. I, I also found from the index of my book that I mentioned the Underground Railroad many times in conjunction with the women's suffrage movement because this person's home was an Underground Railroad station and this person was visiting our home known as an Underground Railroad station. Um, and, you know, maybe being a Black woman, those things popped out at me more. But that was certainly something. And I didn't know anything about this free produce movement. I don't think it was ever mentioned in school. I, the idea of people boycotting uh, for anti-slavery was mm -hmm. not, not something I had come across very often. Um, so that was surprising. Uh, the degree to which Black people were involved, and, and particularly Black men were involved in the women's suffrage movement, um, was certainly new to me. And I think it is to a lot of other people. So there's, you know, there are a lot of surprises. And, you know, the other thing is that a lot of these women were, they weren't just, they, they were active in three or four contiguous movements, including the temperance movement, in addition to the Underground Railroad, in addition to the abolition movement in general, in addition to the free produce movement. So there's, you know, a lot of them, they knew each other already from these activities. Um, as a, you know, they, they were multi-purpose activists. Um, doing many things at the same time, going to the same meetings, going to the same conventions, traveling together. Um, it's it's all very interesting when you start to, to sort it out and, and pick out who, who was together at this session or that session. So We do have time for a few more questions if anyone has any. I don't see anything. I don't see anything in the chat. Maybe there's a, in the Q and A. There are other questions. No, no, no new answered. questions. We've answered. Oh, we have a new one. What's your okay. next project? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm um, as I, I was explained to, to Rachel before. I spend a lot of my time um, editing other people's books, ghostwriting other people's books um, and I'm and writing book proposals for other people's books. I also, ha I currently have a couple of book proposals out for myself. Um, one of them is to um, gather up the writings of uh, women about how we feel about some of these uh, shootings of black men and the vulnerability in general, mm -hmm. black men and police encounters. My, my own essay is about raising special needs sons and being afraid of how they might encounter uh, white police authority. Um, so that's actually that idea has been floating around for like seven years and had to be rewritten last year after George Floyd was, was shot. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're circulating it again in, in, the, in the shadow of, of those happenings last summer. Um, I'm also proposed at, um, playing with the idea of doing something else, uh, on the Harlem Renaissance movement mm -hmm. that would be very similar to this in a way because it focuses not on what was produced or the writers or the um, literature itself, but on, on the fact that it was a heavily directed um, civil rights effort um, that was um, masterminded by really three or four people, depending on who, who someone of the experts list. Um, but to look at those people and the things they did to foster the Harlem Renaissance movement, who, who they mentored and who they got published and how they got them paid and things like that. So, and that's gonna also require a lot of re research and, and, and reading. So it, it gets back burned from time to time. And I'm, I'm also working, um, with uh, a major civil rights figure on their book um, and possibly a uh, former Black Panther on the book. 
Well, I'll be interested in reading all the new projects that you are working on. So one more question I think we have time for. And I, I didn't say earlier, but I, I have visited Arch Street Meeting House. A friend of ours was memorialized there about a year ago. So, mm -hmm. and I've also spoken to other uh, meeting houses. So, so it looks like we don't have any more questions. So I just want to say thank you, Angela, for joining us tonight, and thank you to all our attendees for making the time and jumping on and listening to Angela talk. I learned a great deal and I'm a fan of the book. So it was great to hear you speak and I hope everyone has a great evening. Great. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great night, everyone.